the Chief Justice of the United States, John G. Roberts, Jr. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Thank Mr. you Chief very Justice. much. Thank you. We are here to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the dedication of the Jackson Center. We do so on an especially significant date. 59 years ago today, the Supreme Court handed down its decision in Brown versus Board of Education, which declared that segregating public school students by race violates the 14th Amendment's guarantee of equal protection. Justice Jackson was, of course, a member of the court that handed down that momentous decision and began the process of undoing the court's grave error in the 19, 1896 case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Now, just weeks before Brown was announced, on March 30, 1954, Justice Jackson suffered a serious heart attack. In mid-May, he was still recovering in a Washington hospital. But symbolic of his resolve, he left the hospital on Monday morning, May 17, and journeyed to the court to be present for the announcement of the Brown decision. Tragically, Justice Jackson suffered another heart attack a few months later and passed away on October 9, 1954. But he left behind an inspiring legacy of a public servant and true patriot. This center stands as a magnificent monument to this great justice. It has attracted numerous visitors from our court, as you've heard. Exactly 10 years ago yesterday, Chief Justice William Rehnquist presided over the dedication of the center. Rehnquist was, of course, law clerk to Robert Jackson. And as it has been noted, I had the privilege of being law clerk to William Rehnquist. And when I was practicing law, I also carried the briefcase of Barrett Prettyman, another Jackson clerk, also here today. So I feel a special tie to the Jackson Center through those connections, and I am especially proud to share this anniversary celebration. This center is an appropriate monument to its namesake, who was well known for his learning and eloquence. The center provides a dynamic home for study, dialogue, and discussion here in the heart of Jackson country. It is easy for those of us who live in Washington to forget that Robert Jackson was shaped by this beautiful rural region. His formative years in Frewsburg and Jamestown, at a time when families and communities relied on the staple virtues of thrift, industry, and self-reliance, were critically important. He became an attorney primarily through apprenticeship and self-study and he practiced law as a country lawyer in this area for 20 years. Now, when he left for Washington in 1934 to serve in President Franklin Roosevelt's administration, he traveled fast and far through the ranks of government. In the brief span of eight years, he moved from general counsel of the Bureau of Revenue to assistant attorney general in the Justice Department's antitrust division, to solicitor general, to attorney general, to Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. But his life was too short. He died at the age of 62 after serving only 13 years on the court. But what a mark he left. By my count, he delivered 154 opinions of the court, 46 concurring opinions, 115 dissents, and another 15 separate opinions concurring in part and dissenting in part. His decisions reflect extraordinary insight and craftsmanship. Many are and will continue to be lodestars of American jurisprudence. The Jackson Center chronicles that extraordinary career and it serves as a vibrant reminder that the good works of great men endure beyond their own limited years. Because Chief Justice Rehnquist had the special privilege of working with Justice Jackson as a law clerk, his insights into the man are especially pertinent. In a 1980 Law Review article, then Associate Justice Rehnquist identified a core attribute that helped to explain the strength of Jackson's character. As Rehnquist put it, Jackson possessed that rare ability to profit from experience, to accommodate his views when experience seemed to require accommodation, and yet to maintain throughout his life a sturdy independence of view that took nothing on someone else's say-so. Consequently, as Jackson steadily progressed from successful small-town lawyer 
to government counsel, to attorney general, and ultimately to associate justice, he was able to carry along, as Rehnquist put it, a measure of Shrewsburg common sense and a recollection that there is indeed life west of the Appalachian Mountains. But what seemed to impress Rehnquist most was that Jackson did not regard his private practice in New York as a route to high office in Washington, nor did he regard his various executive branch positions as a series of stepping stones to the Supreme Court. Rather, as Rehnquist put it, he served each of the interests he was bound to serve faithfully and well during the time which he undertook to serve them. He never used them as means merely to further his career. Now, even as Supreme Court Justice, Jackson answered a further call to government service and took on one of the most challenging assignments of his extraordinary life. He accepted President Truman's assignment to serve as chief counsel for the United States in the prosecution of the Nazi war criminals at Nuremberg. Jackson temporarily took leave of his judicial responsibilities, a matter of some controversy, and returned to the role of lawyer because the president asked him to serve his country in that capacity. He understood the gravity of his assignment. As he put it in his famous opening statement at Nuremberg, we must never forget that the record on which we judge these defendants today is the record on which history will judge us tomorrow. We must summon such detachment and intellectual integrity to our task that this trial will commend itself to posterity as fulfilling humanity's aspirations to do justice. He spoke to the California State Association of the Bar while an associate justice on the Supreme Court. His talk is one of those rare 60-year-old speeches that remains completely relevant and indeed is very pertinent to today's Supreme Court. He correctly noted that the justices do indeed rely heavily on oral presentation. And he, used, uh, he urged his clients to choose their lawyer based on skill rather than prominence. He cautioned the lawyers against wasting their time flattering justices. He noted that we justices think well enough of ourselves already. <laughs> now, I will have to leave it to others to decide if that's changed since Justice Jackson's time. Jackson urged the advocate to maintain focus on key arguments, and he pointed out that questions should be welcomed. As he put it, it is clear proof that the inquiring justice is not asleep. Jackson recognized that the purpose of the argument is always and only to assist a court in resolving a legal dispute. He saw oral advocacy as a high art and knew from his own experience that a skilled lawyer must have a rounded life and balanced judgment to draw inspiration from reason and practical experience. But today, he would see a large portrait of himself, one of only four portraits in the room, hanging on the wall supervising the work of today's court. Now, when I look at that portrait, I often remember a story that Jackson told which aptly describes the proper role of a lawyer and a judge. The story is a parable of three stonemasons who were working together on a structure. Each one was asked, in turn, what he was doing. The first said, without looking up, I'm earning a living. The second said, pointing to the wall, I'm shaping this stone to the pattern. But the third lifted his eyes skyward and said, I am building a cathedral. Now, for some lawyers and perhaps for some judges, the law is merely a way of earning a wage. And others cannot see beyond shaping a pattern according to precedent. But some inspired lawyers and judges, like Justice Jackson, have understood that they are participating in a loftier enterprise. The Jackson Center is an enduring monument to that ideal. Members of the bench and bar must aim their efforts at working together to build a cathedral, what we call the rule of law. It is an endeavor in which we should take great pride. I congratulate the Jackson Center on 10 sterling years supporting that endeavor. Thank you very much.